All right, let me get the screen on. Try that again. Is it going to turn on? Let's see. There it goes. All right, everybody, let's get started. Um, all right, um, let's go through some logistics um, because I want to make sure that everybody is clear specifically about Wednesday. Um, hopefully the last homework was pretty clear, um, but I kind of, while we are going to be, you know, continuing our discussion of influence lines today, I kind of want to take a little bit of a side discussion and talk about the project. So how many of you have started working on it, hopefully? Okay, good. How's it going so far? Going good? Okay, if you have not yet started working on it, just to be blunt, you probably should. <laughs> um, just point blank. Um, what I would strongly suggest, and, I, and I've, I've had this conversation with a few students, where I mentioned in class that you should watch lecture 13 before you nosedive into it. And then I've had students nosedive into it and they've had issues. And then I say, did you watch lecture 13? And they look at me like, oh wait, he did say that, didn't he? Um, so I, I really would rewatch lecture 13 to make sure that uh, you sort of, you know, I don't, I don't wanna see you waste time. Um, and I go through a lot of tips and tricks to make the, uh, 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 homework a little easier. So I would say lecture 13 and then the um, the lecture, I have a small video on VLOOKUP. Trust me, it'll, it'll make your life a little easier. Um, let's talk about Wednesday. So Wednesday is going to be different. I'm not going to come in here with slides and lecture notes. I'm not even taking attendance. We're just going to come in here and the goal of Wednesday is for you to come in and work on your project. I'm not taking attendance so you could come or not, but the idea is to help you all troubleshoot the mass tan, the calculations, the design, all of that, okay? Um, everybody good with that? So again, I would say if you have not yet started on your project, you should, so, because um, I don't want, I, what I don't want it to do is just be a ton of work at the very last minute, okay? Sound good? All right, we do have some other business to conduct today, though. We do need to continue our discussion of influence lines, so let's get into it. <coughs> Now, <laughs> I just want to make sure that we're all clear. We are still, you know, utilizing the same concepts, the Mueller-Breslau principle. We're identifying a response of interest, um, moving that response or moving the structure um, through a unit displacement by removing from the structure the ability to resist that response. The resulting deflected shape is the influence line, which is why for statically determinant structures, the influence line is always straight because if you take a determinate structure and remove a response from it, you get an unstable structure, so it's not going to deform. Um, we have our influence lines for reactions. We're not really going to use those too much today. Today what we're going to do is look at these a little bit more in depth. So these are influence lines for internal shears and moments. Now, like the previous lecture, we actually didn't draw many influence lines. We just used them. That's going to be the case with today's lecture uh, as well. Um, specifically today, what I want to talk about um, is the main root uh, which spurred the reason for influence lines to begin with, uh, and that's bridges. So let's, let's talk a little bit about bridges. So when we're designing bridges, and uh, we can uh, lean on our previous lecture a little bit, um, we're really um, focused on primarily two different types of forces. We have dead loads and live loads. Now, in the real world of bridge engineering, we have a lot more to consider, you know, maybe earthquakes and, you know, centrifugal forces and things like that. But, I mean, for most um, routine, everyday bridges in non-seismic regions, dead loads and live loads are really uh, what we need to account for. 
Now, the truth is, when we're designing a highway bridge, um, we need to design that bridge to carry, you know, vehicular loads, but we're not really designing bridges for Honda Civics, okay? We're designing bridges for what I'll call trucks that produce meaningful load demand. So if you're ever, you know, driving down the road, um, the, the bridges, you know, they get the cars for free. The, the, the cars on the, on the um, bridge don't really produce the, the significant um, force demand on bridges like trucks. And, and specifically, when I say trucks, what I'm talking about are what I'm calling exclusion vehicles. So things like short haul vehicles, concrete mixers, anything that produces a very significant load demand uh, uh, on a given highway bridge. Now, the question is, do you have to design for all of them, all of the potential permutations and iterations of uh, exclusion vehicles on highway bridges in the United States? The answer is no, okay? Um, instead, ASHTO, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, they've developed a, um, a model that simulates the worst case extreme loadings uh, on highway bridges in the United States, and we term that the HL-93, and the 93 stands for the fact that it was developed in, in 1993, okay? Um, the live load model that we use in the United States, the HL-93, is composed of three components, okay? Um, the first, com I'm actually working backwards, okay? So the first component is a lane load. It is a 640 pound per foot distributed load. Um, we've already had problems uh, up until now where we take a... Uh, a structure and we say here is a live load of two kips per foot or three kips per foot where do I place that load to generate worst case response and then what is that response we've already answered that question because we did that on Friday um, for ASHTO the design lane is equal to 640 pounds per foot so if you want to think about uh, if you want an analogy an analogy might be um, a constant stream of traffic that might be what the design lane represents the design tandem uh, is two uh, 25 kip axles that are four feet apart, so it maybe kind of looks something like this. Uh, and the tandem uh, is more intended to represent um, uh, uh, heavy concentrated force effects uh, on, a, uh, on a given bridge. Now the design truck, this is what the design truck looks like. Um, it's a three axle truck. So um, when I say axle, so for example, this front axle weighs eight kips. So if the axle weighs eight kips, that means each wheel weighs four kips, right? So we have two four kip wheels, two 16 kip wheels, two 16 kip wheels, okay? Um, this is the HL93 design truck. The front axle is eight kips, the rear axles are 32 kips each. Um, the distance between the front two, uh, the, or the first two axles is fixed at 14 feet. The distance between the two rear axles is variable. It varies from 14 feet to 30 feet. Uh, and it's your responsibility to vary that in order to generate worst case responses. And you're gonna see what I mean by that here in a bit. And if that part seems a little confusing, it's a lot easier than you would think. Now, I will mention some extra terminology for you. Remember, if this axle is eight kips, then the wheel is four kips. So this wheel is four kips, this wheel is 16 kips. Four plus 16 is 20, right? Sometimes you will hear engineers refer to this truck as the HS20-44. Uh, uh, the HS20, the 20 stands for the fact that the first two acts, the first two wheels add up to 20. Four kips plus 16 kips is 20 kips. Uh, and 44 stands for the fact that this truck is an older truck. I mean, this is an older model. This was developed in 1944. Um, the idea back in the day was, uh, I mean, and I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat oversimplifying this, but when we were first developing bridge specifications, you know, in the earlier part of the 20th century, um, what we were telling engineers is that you had a truckload and you had a lane, you had a truckload and you had a lane load, and what you did is you considered the worst case of either one. Well, fast forward a few decades, and now the loads on highway bridges have increased, and essentially what this load model says is instead of taking one or the other, you sort of combine them, okay? So you say, so what you do now is you take the truck in the lane or the tandem in the lane. And, and whichever one of those two cases gives you the worst case response, that, that's what you design for. 
I am oversimplifying things a little bit, but for the sake of discussion in here, that's kind of what we do uh, for live loads. And <clears throat> what I want to do to make sure that we understand how to apply influence lines to handle a real world problem is I want to do one, okay? So we're going to take a bridge that's 80 foot long, so an 80 foot long simply supported bridge, and I want to determine the shear and moment envelopes due to those three components at this section right here, okay? So we're actually going to be computing a lot of different values for this problem, okay? So let me get another marker. All right. So, so for this problem, what we're going to be focused on is we're going to have four loads, or sorry, three loads. So the lane load, we're going to have the tandem, and we're going to have the truck. Okay, and for each of these, what we're going to try and determine is a worst case positive shear, a worst case negative shear, a worst case positive moment, and a worst case negative moment. And so the same thing here. Okay, now <clears throat> before we, you know, go down the rabbit hole, I wanted to tell you a couple things. Number one, I have given you the influence line for both shear and moment at this particular section of interest. And so what I will do is I will say that this is at x equals 30 feet, okay? And um, if I take 30 divided by 80, what is 30 divided by 80? It is 3 eighths or 0 0.375, right? Am I right on that? So we'll say that this is 0 0.375 L, okay? Because as I said, engineers, we typically do this at 10th point. So this is a little bit of an atypical location to be finding these, but you'll, you'll see how that fits into the big picture here in a bit. Okay. Now, here's the influence line for shears at this section. Here's the influence line for moments at this section. Now, before we do any calculations, does this influence line for moments tell you anything about some of these values? Let me, let me ask it a little bit more specifically. What are these going to be? Zero. Zero. There is no negative bending on this bridge at all. If I take traffic and I put it on top of this bridge, this bridge is only going to smile at us. It will never frown at us. It's impossible. The influence line tells us that because when we move a unit load across the structure, we get zeros, or we, we, do, we, we either get positive values or zeros. We never get any negative values. So before even doing any calculations, this is zero. So we had 12 values to discover. We've already figured out uh, three of them. Okay. Now the way that we're going to do this is we're going to handle the, like this in this order because in my opinion, it gets more complicated from left to right. Like this is the easiest, this is a little more challenging, this is even more challenging. So we're gonna handle this one first, <clears throat> all right? Now, I'm gonna pull up my notebook here. I'm gonna be honest with you, I kind of cheated a little bit because I wanna show you what I've done here. So here's the problem, okay? And if you notice, I'm gonna scroll up and down. I've actually taken this image and I've copied and pasted it a few times and I did that so that I wouldn't have to scroll up and down and up and down. I wanted to try and have it all in one spot. So I kind of cheated a little bit, my apologies, but um, I wanted to uh, uh, try and make it a little bit more pleasant experience for you all seeing the screen. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with the design lane load and we're gonna see if we can determine worst case response, okay? Now, does anybody remember how much that load is? What's the magnitude? It was just on that slide a second ago. It's 0 0.64 kips per foot. That marker really did fall again, didn't it? Okay. All right. Now, I am trying to determine the worst case response due to a distributed load. Now, if I have a distributed load, 
what values do I need to discern from my influence line in order to be able to generate those values? The area is under the influence line. That's exactly right. So what is the area? Let's take the shear influence line. What's the area under this and this? How do we determine that? Base times height over 2. So that means we need to break out the Casio FX 115ES plus or similar scientific calculator. Including these folks that are sitting up front that don't have their Casio FX 115ES pluses or similar scientific calculators out in front. I can't believe it. I'm starting to wonder if these folks up front brought their Casio FX 115ES plus or similar scientific calculators. Okay. Okay. Negative 5.625 here. I, that's kind of crowded. Let me do this. All right. What about the positive one? Anybody got a positive one? Okay. Now, what about the moment? Anybody have a moment one right here? Because all we have to do is take the height times the entire length over 2. 750. That zero looks suspiciously like a six. <clears throat> All right. So therefore, let's take V lane. Let's do positive. Okay. How do you tell me what to do? How do I compute the worst case positive shear from the lane load? Tell me how to do it. You tell me. Exactly right. We just take the load times the area, right? Hold on. And if you want a unit on that area, it's feet, okay? And V lane minus is all right <clears throat> all right these I'm gonna do for you so I'm gonna get 10 kips and I'm gonna get minus 36 kips anybody calculate those with me though okay you, you got a thumbs up from you okay the lane load Oh, it's 3.6. Yep, you're right. It's 3.6. Yeah, I wrote that kind of tiny. Yeah, that's 3.6. This is 750 and the units are feet squared if if you're worried about the units. Um so, uh, I'm getting a value of 480. Anybody else get that? Okay. And then remember, M lane negative is zero, right? So, we've already got these values figured out. So, this is... And that's zero. So for that lane load, that is in fact the worst case loading that we could get at that point. Okay, make sense? Okay. So that part's pretty simple. Okay. Now let's do the design tandem. Okay. Now, like I said, this one is a little bit more challenging. We've got a little bit more work to do, okay? Now, um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, and I'm going to take this picture. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so that we can all kind of see what's going on here. Okay? So here's our tandem. It is two 25-kip axles, and it is spaced, uh, the axles are spaced four feet apart. So as the truck or as the tandem is driving down the bridge, 
we sort of want to figure out where do we need to park that tandem in order to generate the worst case response, okay? And um, then we need to determine that response, okay? Now, let me show you how we're going to do that. Um, now, the first off, the first value that I'm going to focus on is this spacing, this axle spacing of four feet, okay? Now, I have values right here, okay? What I'm going to do is I want to determine influence line values right here. Ah, I need to put my pen on, sorry. I want to determine an influence line value right here and an influence line value right here. Okay, and where are those values? Well, this distance right here is four feet. Okay, I want to go ahead and determine these. Okay, and, you, and you'll, you'll see what I'm, what I'm going to do here in a second, but let, just, just bear with me. Okay, now let's start off with this one right here. Okay, so this value right here, this is 0 0.625 at this tip value right here. How do we determine this value? The slope ratio, right? And, but I'll, I'll tell you um, what we can do is we can say, so we can use the slope ratio, but another way we can do that, we can actually be kind of a little bit more basic with this. What is this distance right here? 50, and what is this distance? 46. So I propose, so we'll, we'll put a little, I don't know, A right here, that this is 0 0.625 times 46 over 50. And so I'm essentially doing the same thing. I'm doing the slope ratio, but I'm just collecting it. Because basically what I'm saying is 0 0.625 is to 50 as something is to 46. And so 0 0.625 times 46 over 50. That, that's what I'm doing. Okay. So give me a value here and let's just do three decimal places. 0 0.575. Okay, so for point B, how am I going to do that? So, so somebody tell me how I'm going to do that. There you go. So 0 0.375 times 26 over 30. And what do we got for this? Negative 0 0.325. Okay. Okay. All right. Is everybody with me on that? Okay. All right. So let me show you why I did that. Okay. I am trying to place this tandem on the bridge to generate the worst case shear. So let's consider worst case positive shear. I don't know about you, but here's my influence line, right? Here's my influence line. So my influence line is telling me that in order to get the worst case positive shear, I need to take this tandem and I need to stick it as far over here as I can. In fact, probably where I need to place the tandem is like right here. That's where I need to place the tandem in order to generate the worst case positive shear. All the way over here. Well, if this is four feet, then I need this value on the influence line and I need this one, right? So therefore, okay, therefore, tell me how to compute the worst case positive shear. How do I do that? Tell me what to do. Exactly. So I've got a 25 kip wheel here and a 25 kip wheel here. 
So I'm going to say 25 kips times 0 0.625 plus 25 kips, 0 0.575. And what are we going to get? Say it again. 30. 30 even. Do I have a second? Okay. So there's my worst case positive shear. 30. Okay. How about my worst case negative shear? Where do I put the tandem? I just take that tandem and I just give it a little scooch, right? I just scooch it a little bit over such that really what's going on is that. That is my worst case location for uh, negative shear for the tandem. And how do I compute that? V tandem negative bless you. All right, and so what do we get for this? Negative 17.5. Okay. All right. Okay. So how do we do this one? Okay. So this is interesting. Okay, so now let's let's take a look at the moment influence line. Let's see if we can reason our way through this. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. Okay. We're gonna have. What, let's let's ask it up here. Okay. So we're gonna have two potential. truck placements, or tandem placements, I should say. But we'll put the section in the same spot, okay? And I just want to see what you all think, okay? Here's option one. We put the tandem right here. Option two, we put the tandem right here. Now, notice with both uh, influence lines, with both situations, I'm putting a load right here. So think, this tandem moves across the bridge. I think it would make sense that at least one of those wheels needs to go right there. Okay, But I'm proposing that we've got one wheel here. We're going to have one wheel here or one wheel here. So which do you all think? Option one or option two? Option two. Now why are you saying option two? Exactly right. That's a hundred percent right. Hundred percent right. Now we're gonna verify that. Hold on, I want to see something. I heard a little beep. Did my is my mic still working? Okay. All right. So all right. So four feet, four feet, and some of you might be thinking. Well, like why, like why is Dr. Mike doing both? If we can tell that that, you know, here let me let me put this in another color. Uh, if we can tell, let let's label these. Let's call this D. Let's call this C. If we can tell that point D is higher, then why is Dr. Mike doing both? It will become a little more clear when we do the truck. But when we do the truck, you kind of need to do both. So you'll you'll see what I mean. Um, so. <clears throat> For C, C is going to be 18.75 times 26 over 30, and D is going to be 18.75 times 46 over 50. Bless you. Okay. So when we chug this out, we should get. 
0.25 and 17.25. So this is 17.25, this is 16.25. So Mr. Dangerfield was correct that we need to place this load over here, okay, because we're going to get a higher value. And what is that value? It is 25 kips, or sorry, whoop, here I am violating my own observation. Okay, and what do we get when we chug this out? 900, 900 even. Okay, so 900. Okay, there we go. <coughs> and remember, that's for positive moment. For negative moment, we've already observed that these are all going to be zero. <coughs> Excuse me. So far so good? Okay. So if that's good, then let's look at our truck. Okay. And okay. Now for the design truck, we've got a little bit more going on here. So let, let's let's handle a couple things. Okay. Is that big enough? Y'all can see the value? Okay. All right. Um, let's use a little bit of common sense. Let's ignore all these fancy influence line plots and let's just get back to brass tacks here. Okay. If I have, if I gave you a bunch of forces, if I gave you a bunch of weights and I said, here's a beam. I want you to put these loads on the beam to generate the worst case bending. Are you going to lump those loads close together or are you going to spread them apart? Well, think, I'm trying to bend this beam as much as possible. Like, if I'm trying to bend this beam as much as possible. If I'm trying to generate the worst case bending, I'm going to stick all the loads in the middle as much as possible, right? I'm not going to put a load out here and a load out here and a load out here. I'm going to suck them together, right? So a question then. If I'm trying to vary these axle spacings in order to generate worst case response, should I use 30 feet or should I use 14? 14. I should use 14. And, and if, if even now um, that seems a little fuzzy, bear with me. You'll bear with me. Okay. You'll, you'll see what I'm getting at. Okay. All right. So that same trick, let, let's do shear first. That same trick of uh, interpolating the influence line, I want to do that again. Only instead of four feet gaps, they're going to be 14 feet gaps. So I need, let's see, this value. Oop, I need to turn my pen on. I need, let's see, like this value right here. And I need this value right here. I need this value right here and this value right there. Where these distances are 14 feet. Here, let me, let me erase that. Okay. So, are, let me ask this, are you okay if I give you these or do you wanna go through these together? Is everybody comfortable computing these? So, if I told you, that this was hold on what, what was good gravy is this, is it just me or is it boiling in here okay all right let me see if i can i just was like for a second i was like what's going on here Larry, crack a window. <laughs> all right 0 0.450 
and 0 0.275. Is that okay? You trust me on that? And then this one, 0 0.2 or negative 0 0.2. And this one, negative 0 0.025. Is that, is that okay? You trust me with those? Okay. All right. Now let me ask you a question. What if I had taken this axle spacing and made it 30 feet and not 14 feet? Well, what would have happened is that either this value or this value, it doesn't really matter which one, but I'll, I'll get to that here in a second, would have shifted further this way, right? Which would have taken the values and made them smaller, which would have generated a lower response. I'm trying to get the biggest response that I can, okay? Is everybody okay with that? All right, so let's look at maximum worst case positive shears, okay? So V truck positive. So what you're telling me is that I need to put the truck right here, right here, and right here, right? That's where I need to put the truck. So that means this is eight kips, this is 32 kips, this is 32 kips, right? I'm waiting for it. waiting for. I was hoping somebody found that out. You're 100% right. Nothing says the truck has to be driving that way. What if the truck was driving that way and we put this as 8 kips and this as 32 kips? There's nothing that says the truck has to be facing this way. It could be facing that way. You're 100% right, Mr. James. What we can do is we can swap the truck to generate the worst case response, reverse it. You're 100% right. So this is going to be 32 kips times 0 0.625. And since I'm running out of room, I'm going to write low. 32 kips times 0 0.45 plus 32 kips times 0 0.275. And so what do we get for that? 36.6. Do I have a second? And then V truck minus, okay, so, all right. Okay, so let's talk about negative. So negative is going to be like that, like that, like that. So let's see. We're going to have a load times. Yeah. Should the last load on the V truck should that be? Oh, oh, yeah, yep. Yeah, that's eight. Thank you. You're right. That's what you're pointing out, right? I, I, yeah. As soon as as soon as you break your hand, I'm like, wait, I messed. Yep, that's what I messed. Okay, so we know that our three influence line values are going to be negative 0 0.025, negative 0 0.2, and negative 0 0.375. Okay, so should it be 32, 32, 8, or should it be 8, 32, 32? 832.32, we want the bigger values down here. So this is 8 kips, 32 kips, 32 kips. So V truck minus is what? 18. Negative 18.6. Do I have a second? Yeah. Okay. All right, so this is okay. So on the last one, remember how I said 
we're going to interpolate on either side. And some of you were like, well, why are we going to interpolate on either side if you know which side's going to go? Well, over here, because we've got three axles, um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to interpolate 14 feet on either side, and I'm going to do it twice, okay? Um, and you're going to see why I'm doing that here in a second, okay? So let me erase my loads up here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do this, then we're going to do this, and this, and that, and that, okay? So we're going to do this twice. Because this part's free, you don't have to pay for it, okay? So... All right, so are you all comfortable with doing this interpolation yourself now that you know how to do this? Are you okay if I just give you these values? Okay, so here we've got 1.25, here we've got 10, here we've got 13.25, and here we've got 8.25, okay? That's after you do the interpolation, okay? Again, I've got to believe you can do that. So like this 10 is going to be 18.75 times 16 over 30. And this one's going to be 18.75 times 2 over 30. Okay. Sound good? Okay. All right, so let's think about load placement. Okay. What load goes right here? Is it an 8 kip load or a 32 kip load? 32. 32. Okay, so I'm going to put a 32 kip load right there. So let's name these. A, B, C, D, E. Now if I had to choose where I'm going to place my next 32 kip load, is it going to be at B or is it going to be at D? D. D. That's a heavier value. So 32 kips goes right here. So that means that I put my 8 kip load right here, right? No. No. Where do I put my 8 kip load? On the 10, right here. Because that's going to generate a bigger value, right? Does that make sense? So the 8 kip load goes right there. And that's where I place the truck to generate the worst case moment. Okay? So what do I get? I get M truck positive equals... So I've got 8, 32, 32, and then I put 10, 18.75, and 13.25. And if you want, you can put units on that. <clears throat> but what do we get when we chug this out? 1104? Do I have a second on that? So this is 11.04. Okay. So I propose that therefore, okay, so if we want, we can do it like this. We can say, you know, V plus, V minus, M plus, M minus. We can say lane, truck, or tandem, truck. And then what we can do is we can say, all right, what do we have? We have 10, 3.6, or negative 3.6. What is that, 480 and zero? And then this is uh, 30, negative 17.5, 900. And then positive 36.6, uh, negative 18.6, and then 1104. That's our answer.
that that is the envelope of ASHTO live loads that we would get at x equals 30 feet, okay? Does everybody kind of get the big picture? Okay. I want to show you something real quick, but before I do, does everybody, does this part make sense? Okay. All right. So I want to show you the results of a real world analysis to try and just make the point, okay? Okay. So whenever you're analyzing bridges in the real world, okay? So first off, notice how what I've done here is I took this and I sort of made it symbolic, okay? Because you could apply this to a number of different problems. Um, what we'll do, it's, what is conventional is to do this at every tenth point, okay? So instead of doing it at, you know, 0.375L, we would do it at 0.2L, 0.3L, 0.4L, 0.5L, 0.6L, okay? Um, and for those points we do it, um, we, we generate the worst case response. So what I'm getting at is that for this bridge, we would do, need to do everything we just did, we would need to do it nine times. That sounds like a pain, doesn't it, right? Which is why we typically do this with software, okay? I don't expect bridge engineers to do this by hand, especially when you can just look it up uh, or have a software uh, uh, package do it for you. So I kinda wanna show you that for an 80-foot bridge, this is actually the results, okay? So what I've got here is I've got the lane truck tandem, lane truck tandem, okay? So let's look at this table up top. This table up top has HL93 envelope shears, and so for the lane, I've got positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. For the moments, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So look at the moments. See how the negative is always zero? That is always gonna be zero. Okay, so what did we do? We did uh, x equals 30 or 0.375L. So let, let's see if we can eyeball our values. Let's look at the shears, okay? So for the lane, we got 10 and negative 3.6. So that's gotta be between these two and these two. That kinda looks right, doesn't it? What about right here? The truck, 36.6. Um, and negative 18.6, kind of looks right, doesn't it? You can eyeball this on all of these and see that it works. Why don't I make it easier for you and let's plot it, okay? So um, what I've done here is I don't want to do, I didn't do all of them, so I only did the truck, so this is the truck and the truck. What I did is I plotted it, and so what you have is across the span, you have the worst case positive shears, worst case negative shears, worst case positive moments, worst case negative moments, okay? And so what I've directly computed here, the blue curve is at every 10th point. So what a bridge engineer would do in practice is that if you wanted the uh, shears and moments in between, you would just interpolate, okay? And so what do we do when we interpolate? Well, let's take a look at the moment. So what do we get when we interpolate at 30 feet? What does that look like, about 1,100? maybe about 1,104. Now, the truth is, if, if you actually interpolate, especially if you have indeterminate structures, it's probably not gonna be exactly 1,104. It's probably gonna be a little off, so there's probably gonna be some error. How do we ensure that that error is manageable? We do enough of these analyses directly so that that interpolation is pretty close. And how much is enough? We do them at 10 points, okay? That's, that's typically what we do. I mean, would your interpolation really get all that better in the grand scheme of things if you did this at 100 points? Probably not. It'd probably be close enough. So, Make sense? All right. The only other thing I wanted to show you is this slide. Um, I wanted to kind of show you what influence lines look like if the structure is indeterminate. Okay? So this is, to be clear, I would never expect you to do this by hand. This would be something that you would use a software package to do because every time that you moved the load across the structure, you would have an indeterminate problem to solve. I would really never expect an engineer to do this one uh, by hand. I would expect them to, to just use some, some mass scan or whatnot to solve it. Um, but what we have here is a two-span bridge with equal spans and I'm drawing influence lines for reactions and for shears and moments at a particular point. And because it's indeterminate, 
you get some positives and negative regions, and you also get some curved regions. Because when you remove from the structure the ability to resist, let's say, this reaction right here, you still have a stable structure. So when you lift that, you move it through a unit displacement, you actually deform it. Okay? But I want to be absolutely crystal clear that the only time influence lines are curved is when the structures are indeterminate. Beyond that, you will have straight line influence lines every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Okay? Does that make sense? So the only time influence lines are curved is when the structure is indeterminate. If I give you a determinate structure on the final and I say draw the influence line and you're drawing curves, slap your hand. You're doing it wrong. Okay? I say that. I know somebody in here will do it, I promise. I promise. I don't want this to happen, but I have a feeling it will. All right, any questions? All right, I'm going to pull the code up, and I will see you all maybe on Wednesday.